What's up? I'm Johnny Piper. I'm with the Facebook page, How to Stop Doing Heroin. I'm here with uh, Brandon Novak, uh, former professional skateboarder. Yeah. Right? yeah. Still kick flipped out, right? Yeah, when time permits. <laughs> right on. Um, he's an author of Dream Seller. Uh, I think you got a couple more books coming out, right? Yeah, three more books coming out. That's awesome. I have uh, the first ever addiction graphic novel coming out. Right. I have a, a documentary going to Sundance and the Con Film Festival title Where's My Needle, which chronicalizes my uh, my drugging career and my sobriety career, all encapsulated in one. Right. I'm a national business developer from Banyan Treatment Center. I help people get help. Mm -hmm. So I have all these different titles. Right. But the title that's always left out, which is the most important, is 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 a person in long-term sobriety. Right, right. Because if that doesn't come first, none of this other shit matters. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. Without sobriety, we don't, we, you know, we can't do anything. You yeah, know? You know? that's it. Yeah, it's crazy. But, um, so you've been sober about three years? I yeah, think, coming now? up on three years. Coming May 25th, years? God willing, will be three years. Right on. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, man, for helping me stay sober. Yeah, I can't you, do this. If I could do this alone, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> right, right, right. Together, yeah. we could do this yeah, thing. Yeah, we're all, you know, it's like they say in the book, man, like, we're all passengers of the, the liner before before shipwreck you know where we all come together and you know pull together and do this absolutely together absolutely man. yeah so um i wrote up a couple questions okay. um and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go off um so how did you initially start doing heroin um the first time i possessed heroin was i i i I sold this guy a whole bunch of weed, and, and he was short on the money, mm -hmm. and he gave me a $100 bag of heroin to make up for the $100 difference he was short. Right. And I'm like, all right, cool, and I put it in my dresser, and I completely forgot about it for like three months. Yeah. And right before, right before the ending of my senior year in high school, I decided it'd be a good idea to blow off graduation and go on Grateful Dead tour. And, and I, I was packing, and I went to put these pair of socks in my luggage. And I felt him, and I felt the bag, and I'm like, oh, shit, I forgot about this. And I pulled it out, and I cut a line, and my buddy did a line, and I threw up instantaneously. But I fell in love instantaneously. Yep. So that was the beginning of the end. Right, The right. beginning of the end of the beginning, if you will. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely relate, man. I mean, especially the throwing up part, it's like, you know. Any any time you you know get into hard drugs like that, dude, like our bodies ain't used to that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy not, reaction. It's a foreign substance that has no business going in my body. Right. So yeah. it just rejects it at all costs. Right. But I'm an addict. I don't understand the word no. <laughs> yeah, it's like the first time I I remember the first time I smoked a cigarette and I tasted it. I was, it was like absolutely disgusting. I said, give me that again. Absolutely, <laughs> you know? man. It's weird how we Yeah, they, like they say insanity is doing the same thing over expecting different results. Yeah. The real deal insanity is doing the same thing over knowing the results. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even expect yeah. anything different. I knew what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. So, um, I mean, what was it that made you want to get sober? Um, I think my age and maturity played a big part. Right. Before I know it, I woke up one day and I had that moment of clarity. And I was a 35-year-old man, homeless, living on the streets of Baltimore, selling my ass for $40. And I'm like, you know, what really kicked in for me was, was before I would shoot up and that delusional effect was produced, which allowed me to escape the reality which I had created for myself. So, so I had become okay with selling my body, sleeping in abandoned houses. But all of a sudden... Every time I'd shoot up, that delusional effect was no longer produced, right. meaning I could not escape the reality that I created for myself. No amount of heroin would allow me to check out, if you will. Right, right. So what do I do when it stops working? It literally stopped working. And I'm like, dude, my very best thinking had got me here. And my bottom this time wasn't my lowest bottom. I've had much lower bottoms. Right. But weirdly enough, it was my lowest bottom because my bottom came up to meet me. Right. I couldn't get any lower than that when it comes up to me. And I'm like, dude, I, the only thing blocking me from, from getting better is me. Right, right, right. The common denominator in my problems is me. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Right, right. So finally, you know, you're in the program, steps one, two, and three. I can't, he can, so let him. That kicked in. I'm like, dude, I can't. Yeah. Someone else can. So why doesn't a power greater than myself help me do this? Because mm -hmm. I tried everything. The only thing I never tried was those 12 steps. 
And the only thing that worked was those 12 steps. Those 12 steps removed the desire and lifted me up the obsession to want to get high. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I can definitely relate, man. Um, you know, I was at my bottom, you know, the drugs stopped working. I had, you know, a ton of money, a ton of drugs. Yeah. And I barely slept because of how worried I was about where I was, you know, what was going to happen next. And, you know, eventually I was like looking into just, you know, hanging it up and killing myself. And, yeah. You know, somehow, you know, somebody from the program actually pulled me out of there, you know, and brought me somewhere else. And that's where I got Hence sober. Hence me saying, we can do this together. Exactly. Yeah. That's the deal, man. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really cool to be in the program and have like, you know, friends today that, you know, we can talk to and, you know go about and like help each other out in like certain ways like i got a ton of friends that i could call if i have a problem literally you know and they can give me like answers that like i might not be able to see for yeah. myself you know dude I, i've never been happier man yeah right and and more importantly internally you yes. couldn't put a price tag on what i have internally yeah. externally i've accumulated some things but that's just par for the course of sobriety right but right. internally man there's no amount of money that could touch what i have right yeah yeah yeah, it's it's great to you know finally feel comfortable in your own skin. Yeah, it's it's really like you know I, I absolutely love that feeling because even before I started doing drugs, like I would never like you know feel comfortable in mm -hmm. certain certain situations. It was like only if it like was benefiting me or something yeah. of some nature. Like I had my you know my mindset on like you know focusing on something else or something. Otherwise, well, that's the deal like, because be uncomfortable. For me, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic. The core of my disease is I'm selfish, I'm self-centered. Mm -hmm. So it's me, 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 me. And if I have three minutes, you, but only if it benefits me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yep. And, and in the beginning, early sobriety, I was like a stranger in my own skin trying to figure out who the fuck let me in. Yes. You know? Yeah. But I, I continued to stay part of the course. I addressed the issues head on. I didn't go around them, above them, or below them. I went through them, and I continued to, to work the 12 steps, and, and, and that internally allowed me to find out who I am. So basically what I did is I uncovered in order to discover in hopes to recover. Right. You know? Awesome. Yeah. So um, I know you've been in rehab before. Uh, yeah. What, uh, what was the difference between the first time you were introduced to the recovery platform Aside from the last time that you were introduced to the recovery platform, the the first time is it wasn't my idea, right. it wasn't my plan. It was suggested by loved ones. So therefore, I had a closed mind and a closed heart. I wasn't open, willing, or receptive to listen to what they had to say. Fast forward twenty one years later to the day from the first treatment center to the thirteenth treatment center, the difference was is that it had became my idea, and for the first time in my life, I didn't have a plan. I walked into that 13th treatment center with no plan. And, and, and the lack of plans produced the best of plans. Right. Because it allowed me to get out of my way. Right, right, right. Because I'm the common denominator in my problems. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the more I stay out of my business, the better my life is. Yeah. Because I'm not running Definitely anything. Right. Yeah. I, don't, I don't steer this ship. Yeah, yeah. You know? I hear you. Yeah, it's, um, you know, our best thinking got us, mm -hmm. you know. And the, in the back alleys of, you know, yeah. of places where we shouldn't be. Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's, it's a great feeling to have, you know, some, you know, something else, you know, steer, you know, steering us in the right direction of like, you know, how we live and, you know, you know, I, I, us, I usually, you know, say like, you know, how am I living my life right in, in their eyes? Yeah, you that's know? it. Like, if you want to know how my sobriety is doing, don't ask me. Ask my mother. Ask my employers, ask my family, ask society. Right. Because right. I'll sell you a dream. You see the title <laughs> of my book. But, like, ask the people that are around me. Right. You right. know? Yeah. That's that's where you get the, you know, the truth because they're all noticing, you yeah. know, what you're doing. You know, you're, they're focused on you. So, um, was there a time where you really wanted to get sober and you just couldn't? Absolutely. A lot of times. 13 inpatient treatment centers, lost count of outpatients and detoxes. I'd say nine of those treatment centers, I had no intentions on getting sober. Right. The remaining four, I really wanted to stop. I absolutely wanted to stop. But I would go in, and, and, and what I know now that I didn't know then is how powerful this disease I possess is. Right. It's the only disease that tells me I don't have a disease on a daily basis, and it talks to me in my own voice. Right. And I'll believe that. So, so I would go in wanting it, 
but not willing to do what it takes to get it. Right. I thought if I just physically sat this down, my life would get better. Uh-huh. Not knowing that, yes, it's the drink and the drug was the driving, motivating factor that got me there, but that's really not my problem. Right, right. That's not the problem at all. Uh-huh. It's the answer. It's the solution. Right. My problem is here, my thinking, my attitude, my behavior. Right, right. Therefore, physically just putting that down, I have no chance. Right. And just putting it down is just merely the tip of the iceberg and getting better. Yeah. I thought that was the end-all, be-all. Mm-hmm. Put it down, go to treatment 30 days, I'm good. Yeah. Because, I mean, once you put it down, what do you have to take you out of yourself? Exactly. You know, that's that's what we look to, you know, when we're using this. Like, you know, we, we look to get out of ourselves. I mean, if, essentially, like, we first, you know, do drugs and stuff and drink because, you know, we like the effects produced. Yes. You know, it's fun at first, but, yeah. you know, it's like it says right in the book, man, like, you know, it ceases to be a luxury and becomes a necessity. Absolutely. You know, so that's, that's where, like, it gets really hard to, like, you know, put it down and, like, you know, I remember times where, like, you know, I was going to get dope and I was, I was like crying yeah i was crying because i didn't want to do it yeah and i just kept going back man it's it's you know it's it's not fun for for us to be no in, you know i remember specifically addiction. getting out of one treatment center and i had my fiance i still have everything holding on by a thread and, and i had this guy coming to meet me and i was secretly scoring some pills and i was doing all these things to make it happen without her realizing or any of my friends realized and finally i get the pills and i go to a bar and, and I'm in the bathroom and I'm crushing the pills up. And as I'm crushing them, I'm seeing my life flash before me. Crush it. There she goes. Crush it. There goes the house. Crush it. There goes the family. Crush it. There goes the friends. And when I put it to my nose to sniff it, I started crying. Because I saw what I was losing. Mm-hmm. Not even losing, giving away. Right. I and knew where it went. I didn't lose it. And I could yourself. not stop. Yeah. Using against my will. Right, right. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. It's, Left to my own devices. Yeah, it's crazy. Like It's like we're on autopilot. Literally. You know? So, But, um... So, uh, how'd you get sober? You did the 12 steps? Absolutely, man. Yeah. When I, what I did was uh, the, the God of my understanding brought me to a 12-step program, and the 12-step program brought me back to the God of my understanding. Right. You know? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not religious. I'm really spiritual, and, and my God has done everything for me. Right, right. I, I didn't do anything. You know, I did a few simple things along the way each day to maintain my sobriety, mm-hmm. but, but he made it possible. Right. You know, he made it like... Like, doable. Right. You know, if justice was due, I'd be dead years ago. I didn't work for this seat. My mother worked for this seat. My friends worked for this seat. My family worked for this seat. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a great way to change your life. That's, that's how I always how I always saw it because, I mean, you know, it essentially just brings you toward your higher power to, like, you know, direct you, you know, in a certain way where you can live life as a decent person. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy how it works. Like, if you would have told me, like, you know, while I was in addiction, like, you know, a book and, like, just following a simple program yeah. would, like, fix your life, I would have told you, you're fucking nuts. But, Absolutely. Like, it's, it's, it's crazy how it works, you know? I always say, thank God God is God and I'm not God because I'd fuck it up. <laughs> and God had a plan for me. And thank God I didn't know what that plan was because I'd fuck it up. Right. <laughs> but I just got out of my way and let him steer the vessel. And, and lo and behold, I'm able to, like, defy odds and logic. And I got sober and God willing stayed sober. And now I can sit here and talk to you and God willing me- deliver a message of hope to somebody that might not be able to see past that bag, bottle, or pill. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what's your opinion on, like, maintenance substitutes, like some boxes? I'm a methadone. fan. Are Bring you- it on. You know, I-, I debated for a lot of years and I shot dope for a lot of years. Right. This is not a one-size-fits-all program. If it was, I would have got clean at my first treatment center at 17. I didn't get it till my 13th treatment center at 35. Right now, where we're at with this opioid pandemic, it's no longer an epidemic, it's a pandemic. Today in the nation, 174 people will die as a direct result of an opioid overdose. Today, it's worse than the AIDS outbreak, it's worse than World War III. The sad thing is, it's all preventable. So at the very least, we're, we're right now at the stage of harm reduction. This is harm reduction. Right. So at the very least, A, if methadone, suboxone, whatever your thing is, if it provides you a life that you're content and happy with, by all means. B, if it doesn't, you know what it does? It at least keeps it, it at least keeps you alive long enough to when you're ready to put it down, then you can try this. Right. Which is a twelve steps completely abstinent based program. 
you know. But who am I to say if it's right or wrong, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so, uh, what are uh, what are some of your favorite <laughs> gifts of sobriety? Um, I'm a son to my mother. I'm a brother to my sister. I'm a brother to my brother. I'm an uncle to my nephew, nephews and nieces. I'm accountable. I'm reliable. I'm dependable. I'm fully self-sufficient. And what I mean by self-sufficient is that, like, uh, self-sufficient upon my higher power, because I don't take credit for this. I don't do this. I've seen me take credit for it, and then I forget where I came from, and I always return because I'll minimize the severity of my disease. Right. Because I have selective memory when it plays in favor of my addiction. Yeah. I'll tell you about six years back when I went to the bar and I had two glasses of wine and I was home in bed by 9 p.m. I can tell you the sat I see that the sat that I sat in the seat that I sat in. I can tell you the barkeep's name that served me and the music playing on the jukebox. Like it just happened because I was able to go home at 9 p.m. after having two drinks. Right. My brain will allow me to block out being medevac to four different hospitals in four different states with four different overdoses. Mother buying me a plot, countless overdoses. See you, buddy. The countless overdoses. Countless overdoses. Love you, man. Countless overdoses. The uh, the mother buying me a plot because that doesn't play in favor of my alcoholism, right? So, so you know. I'm just a product of the environment of my higher power in a 12-step program. Right, right. I seen um, a little while ago. I was uh, you hosted at you know Easter uh, brunch yeah. at your at yeah. house. I remember you know reading that you know you said how much this means to you to be able to host a family party like at your house. Yeah, you know that's yeah. really cool, man. That's sobriety to me. Yeah, yeah. The you know mending those relationships that were non-existent or in turmoil right that's right. sobriety yeah, yeah you know becoming yeah. a productive member of society even as cliche as that sounds yeah yeah, yeah that's, that's and now i get man. to help people that can't see past that bag bottle or pill mm-hmm. and that's yeah. it my defects have became my biggest assets right with the slightest change in perception change change your perception change your world my mentality will create the reality for which I live in. So how am I viewing things? Right, right. Yeah. So um, where do you see yourself in five years? Man, once again, if I want to make my God life, I tell him how my day is going right. to go. I didn't see myself here in three years. I walked into this journey with eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, one stick of deodorant, fit into a bag that doubles a pillow and four cigarette butts I dug out of a receptacle yeah. with my mother praying to God, please cure him, kill him, or kill me. Right. So, like, uh, I can't even say it. Because I know anything is possible provided I don't drink a drug. Right, right, right. And I don't doubt that. That was that was um, my next question. What if I asked you that question, you know, a few years prior while you were using? Like, where would you see yourself in five uh, years? I, you know, I knew that my life was going to end up one of two ways. I would always go to meetings while I was getting high. People would be like, why are you going to those meetings? Because I really believed and I really knew it was going to end up one of two ways. Either I was going to die with a needle in my arm or I was going to get sober. Right. Like, I, there was no happy medium where, like, I'm content with being a junkie the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Like, it was going to be one of those two ways. Yeah. So. My, um, you know, I only saw, you know, my outlet was either I'm going to die, I'm going to go to jail, or, you know, or I'm somehow going to get clean. And I didn't see getting clean as an option because I had this fear of like, you know, telling my parents that I have a problem. You know, I didn't want to like show my father like some kind of weakness or something. Sure. Or like break my mother's heart, you know. And um, For the so millionth I, time. Yeah, like, and I didn't want to like, you know, you know, go to them and like tell them like I got a problem. So like what I saw was jail or death. And like I was looking forward to jail. Like, as my delusional thinking would progress, like, going to jail seemed like a great idea. Yeah. Because, I, you know, I won't do drugs in jail, yeah. of course. And yeah. then, um, you know, I'll, I'll be able to get my weight up. I'll get some yeah. crystal tattoos. People will believe know? me now. <laughs> They'll tell me they love me. And I equate love to the word $10. Yeah. You like, know? It's, you know, it's just the way, the way, you know, we think, like, while we're using it, it's just, like, totally... Totally out there. But, the um, abnormal becomes the normal. Yeah, exactly. Living on that animalistic level. Yeah, exactly, man. It's, it's I get crazy. It. You know, it's, you know, it's, I just, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't foresee myself getting sober. No. You know, it was, it was scary. Like, you know, trying to get into a rehab. Like, I cut rehabs and like all that stuff like out of the equation. I never thought it'd be possible for me to like go to a rehab. Yeah. You know, and then uh, eventually, like, you know, it was like, 
I was about to kill myself, and then like you know, somebody brought me to a um, a hardwood floor on you know on one of the one of the biggest like you know drug sets in, yeah. in the East Coast, and that's where I got sober. Yeah, you know, and it's, I mean it was crazy, man. Like you know. I had this creepy old guy tell me, like, he don't give a fuck if I live or die. Like, he said, what? if you want to get high, go get high. It's yeah. Like, if you want to get your life together, buckle down and do this. Absolutely. Like, do this for yourself, you know. So I get it. You know, get, getting sober, you know, it, it wasn't, yeah, like you said, it wasn't my plan. No. You know? <laughs> and now what I've learned is sobriety is giving me everything that drugs and alcohol promised me right. tenfold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like, do you have any, like, short message you would want to tell somebody, like, getting, you know, that's out there using, like, to tell them, you know? Yeah, so you know, the, the, the disease of addiction is not a death sentence. And as long as you're breathing, it's never too late. Your history does not have to dictate your future. If you can't see past the bag, bottle, or pill, I get that. It makes sense to me why you choose to shoot dope and try to get help. I do a lot of interviews, and they say, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? And honestly, the craziest thing I ever did was walk into my 13th inpatient treatment center, May 25th, 2015. That was the most terrifying thing I've ever done in a pretty chaotic world I've lived in. Um, but we can help you, man. I can help you. We can do this together. By myself, I'll continue to get high and I'll die. More than that, I won't die. I'll wake up every day using against my will. So, like, if you're looking for a way up and out, man, you can personally reach me at 610-635-9092. I'll do whatever it takes humanly possible to help you. Right on. That's awesome. Brandon, thanks for... Um, thanks for taking the time, man, and being part of the solution. Yeah. You know, you, and I brother. talk all around the, the nation and the world, and they're like, what's the answer? What's the answer? If, if, if I knew the answer, I would bottle it up and sell it and be a billionaire a billion times over. Yeah. There is no answer. It's a lot of trial and error. So I always say, just do something. More than talk about it. So you doing this is like doing something, man. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Yeah, man. Cool. Cool. Take care, brother.